Okay, let's, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Today we're gonna do a little bit of a different thing than I've done in some of the other talks that I've led. And the goal is to introduce to you a new foundation that began in the last few years to honor Larry Gross, who was a patient of mine and had dementia with Lewy bodies and passed away. And his family has taken the lead in doing some things that I wanted to share with you, but I want to set the table for why I think this is important. Before I proceed, let me just by a show of hands find out how many are you, of you are students or residents? And how many are physicians? And how many are nurses? And how many of you don't fit any of those categories? <laughs> so a good, a good assortment, okay. So I, <laughs> so the first thing I wanna point out, I'm a neurologist and my specialty area has been in dementia and neurocognitive disorders. But really what I want us to be recognizing is the topic I want, to, I want us to address is not specifically a neurology topic. Dementia and the diseases that cause dementia really is a problem for everyone. And that's an important point of all of us getting together today. This is a slide that shows the frequency with which Alzheimer's disease, obviously a common cause of dementia, occurs in the United States, and how often we think this is going to be true in the years to come. Whoops. So currently, we're here somewhere around here, that so we think there's about seven million or so people in the US, not just with Alzheimer's disease, but Alzheimer's disease that has worsened to the point that it's caused what we're going to call dementia, and I'm gonna define some of those terms in a moment. And obviously that number is going to increase over time, it's expected, so by the year 2060, we think that number is gonna be not quite 14 million people. There aren't enough neurologists for all that. This is a societal problem. And if you don't care about the human cost, there's a cost cost. This slide estimates that Alzheimer's disease and other dementia causing diseases cost us 345 billion with a B dollars a year. And as I say, there are not enough neurologists for all this. Now, there are some neurologists in the room, including some medical students who are going into neurology. I'm very proud of the fact that this year we're having seven of our graduating medical school class going into neurology, which I think is a record for us. And I hope that trend continues, but that's still just seven. We take 128 medical students a year, seven are going into neurology, and actually that's a lot. If you have dementia, every medical problem becomes worse. These are data to show how often people are admitted to the hospital with a number of different medical diagnoses and what happens if those people happen to have dementia. So people who have a dementia disease are in this darker color and people who don't are in this lighter color and you can see every one of these lines, the people with dementia are worse. So these are people being admitted for COPD, congestive heart failure, stroke, chronic kidney disease, coronary artery disease, diabetes, various cancers. Dementia causes more medical problems or it makes medical problems more likely to be problematic. This is a problem for everyone. It's not just a problem for neurologists. Here are data to show how often it is that people with various diseases end up in the emergency department. If you have Alzheimer's disease or another dementia, it increases the likelihood of you showing up in the emergency department by 28%, more than if you have heart failure or stroke or ischemic heart disease or hypertension or COPD or cancer or diabetes. Each of these medical problems increase the likelihood those people show up in an emergency department, but not as much as people who happen to have a dementia. These data are telling us the number of unique patients with a dementia seen annually by different specialists. These are neuropsychologists, these are neurologists. On average, 115 unique contacts 
with a dementia patient, not as much as primary care physicians or emergency department physicians who have 266 a year on average. So this is a problem for everyone. I'm saying that so the non-neurologist <laughs> won't, won't start leaving the room, right? So I want to spend a little bit of time and be a little science-y and talk about where we're at so you understand what already is happening, the progress that I think we've already made, and there are some good things to say about where we're at in understanding how to diagnose and manage and evaluate and, yes, to some degree, treat. But I want to talk also about what's missing and what we can do about what's missing in terms of our ability to handle this problem. So where are we at? How do we approach? I want to take us from beginning to end in how we approach a patient who comes to us with some kind of a memory or cognitive complaint. And we have to begin by recognizing that these people need evaluating. We can't simply say, since you're telling me you're forgetful, therefore you are, and therefore you have a disease. The good news is sometimes failing to remember something is perfectly normal, not fun but perfectly normal. You and I normally forget things. Neurocognitive capacities have a failure rate, just like everything else does. Walking or hitting a baseball or being able to sleep at night have failure rates. To some degree, therefore, this is a normal phenomenon. It's also the case, a variety of research shows, that becoming less good at whatever your capacity to remember things might be becoming less good at it is to some extent adaptive. It allows us to focus our cognitive resources on other tasks that may be more dominant and important in our life at that point. Sometimes failing to remember things as an impairment may occur for reasons that have nothing to do with the brain directly. For example, you could be very distracted. There could be situations where you're now working in environments where there's more noises or there's a new uh, coworker that you find attractive or interesting or you want to talk to, or annoying, you want to get away from. <laughs> These things take some of your attention so you can less well remember things for later. If you're distracted, you're not fully present. You're not fully in the moment. And it's not really fair to blame it on memory if you are never engaged enough in a task to then be able to recall later what that was happening with that task. If you are being asked to do more things, you're, you're, you're uh, multitasking, you're trying to do lots of things at once, attention is finite. There's only so many things you can devote it to. As a result of which, one thing may now get less ability to be remembered for later. You could have a problem with hearing. You can't be expecting people to recollect what they never heard you say. You could be less good with your memory today because you didn't get good sleep last night or you're feeling sleepy right now, which isn't quite the same thing. So a lot of non-memory things can be the cause, and many things can cause a memory complaint. Could be a problem with your ability to perform and show an otherwise normal capacity that you have. It could be a physiologic thing. It's appropriate for memory to get different with age. It's appropriate for it to change as an adaptive things at times. Or you could actually be impaired you could actually have a less good memory capacity. And that could occur either because the brain is the victim, it's stuck in a body with heart failure, it's stuck in a body with glucose that's going up and down, it's stuck in a body where someone's taking topiramate or amitriptyline or a medication that is making it hard to use your brain, or it could be the brain is the perpetrator. So lots of things are possible, patients deserve to be listened to and evaluated to consider all this broad domain of things. Now let's make sure we understand some terms. We've got good words when we're describing neurocognitive impairment to talk about a specific topic. If you have a problem with language, we call that aphasia. If you have a problem with um, being able to uh, read, we call that alexia. So if you have a pure, isolated, circumscribed deficit, we've got words for that. So that begs the question then, what do we do if you have a couple of different problems? And that's where the word dementia really was born. The word dementia, if you just take the word apart, it's ment, mentation, and de, decreased, de-ment. So as this page from the Alzheimer's Association comments, 
Dementia really isn't a diagnosis. It's not a disease. It's a description of symptoms. So if we say someone has dementia, it's kind of like saying they have a sore throat or a rash. We've said something, but we haven't really given a diagnosis. So how do we, how do we define the word? It's a clinical state, which means a clinician decides you have dementia, not a test or a picture, but a clinical evaluation and summary of a story that includes this. There is an abnormal, acquired, so not something you've had your whole life, issue where multiple, not just one, multiple areas of neurocognition are objectively impaired, measurably impaired, not just not as good as you would like it to be. By convention, we only say this if that cause, the cause of that impairment is brain damage. It's going on for a while. It's not just a bad week or month. And it impairs the person's ability to func function. If you have these seven things, we use the word dementia. It's just a clinical shorthand, which then, of course, begs the question, what do you do if someone's very functional? What if a person is well adapted? to their cognitive impairment. Well, then that's where we use the phrase mild cognitive impairment. Mild cognitive impairment sometimes, but not always, worsens into dementia. How often? Not quite 15% of MCI, mild cognitive impairment patients, will be worsened in a year, so we call that dementia. Okay, so these are some terms. And we can add one more term, one more phrase, and that's subjective cognitive decline. These are the folks who years ago I would have called the worried well. People say, gosh, I think I'm getting forgetful. I can really tell I'm not the same. But you evaluate them and you test them. They test it OK. And I say, you don't have to worry. You test it OK. Well, it turns out if you define subjective cognitive decline this way, someone who observes themselves that they are markedly different, but there is no obvious explanation. You test them out. They're OK. It turns out such people sometimes worsen and sometimes don't. So here's a meta-analysis looking at not quite 30 studies of not quite 30,000 people who on average are a little over 70, followed by not quite five years. And what the study found is that five years later, people with subjective cognitive decline about 25%, not quite 25%, now have worsened, so we now call it mild cognitive impairment. And another 10% or so have worsened, so we now call it dementia. So people with subjective cognitive decline, these data would imply, about two-thirds of them, five years later, you would still say it's subjective cognitive decline. You're not feeling as sharp as you once were, but we still wouldn't give you any other clinical label and you're still not impaired. The problem is that that one-third conversion rate, that minority that convert, is about twice what you would expect people who don't experience subjective cognitive decline. So where we're at is that people may acquire a brain disease and at a minimum that produces without symptoms signs of a disease in their brain but with no symptoms at all. They're not even noticing it some of whom will progress and worsen so they can say, gosh, I can tell I'm worse, subjective cognitive decline, and some may worsen to mild cognitive impairment or possibly a mild, moderate, or severe stage of dementia. Now, there's a disease out there maybe you've heard of. It's called Alzheimer's disease. It's been in all the papers. You've heard of it? Yes. Okay. Well, no one said anything. I couldn't tell. <laughs> so Alzheimer's disease we know well. And we've known for some time how to diagnose it. There are rules for deciding if, at least in this case, the dementia that a person has fits well with the idea that it's being caused by Alzheimer's disease. These rules work pretty well. If you apply these clinical rules and do an appropriate workup for a patient, the vast majority of time, if you were to go to an autopsy, you would also find Alzheimer's disease. How do we decide what the autopsy diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease should be like? Well, Alzheimer himself gave us most of the features we still use to define Alzheimer's disease at autopsy. The first is that there's a loss of the synaptic connections between nerve cells, usually but not necessarily also involving a loss of nerve cells themselves. And we can at least indirectly make a guess about some of this 
when nerve cells are lost because the brain becomes atrophic. And it doesn't become atrophic and shrunken everywhere, but in particular places. And we can parse out which parts of the brain are atrophic. This is a picture from uh, one of my patients here that our radiologists put pretty colored pictures on to help share with us which parts, the volumetric measurements of different parts of the brain. So MRIs and other structural imaging scans can indirectly give us a little bit of a biomarker, not so much for a loss of synapses, but a loss of cells. Secondly, amyloid plaque. Amyloid plaque was suggested over 30 years ago to be due to a cascade of events, which this paper argued and others have championed since, is actually the, the, disease, the disease, the cause of the disease. And there's a bit of scientific controversy about that. But the idea is that on a chromosome 21, you have the code for a protein called the amyloid precursor protein, which most of us cleave in ways that eventually release a fragment, a peptide fragment, that forms uh, with other fragments together a collection of fragments and eventually populates the amyloid plaque. Some of us have an enzyme that cleaves this protein differently, so this doesn't happen. And a small, very small percentage of Alzheimer patients overexpress these bad enzymes, or, um, and so they're more likely to have Alzheimer's disease, or some of us express this enzyme more, and so we're less likely to have it, but most of us have the same amount of these different enzymes, so most of us are at some risk for going down this pathway. This is clearly a process that occurs in Alzheimer's disease. Amyloid plaque is, a, is stuff that you see in between nerve cells, and you see it in Alzheimer's disease. And the third thing you see, and you have to have all three, to have the neuropathology diagnosis is neurofibrillary tangles. What are these? These are when the normal cytoskeleton of a nerve cell, so a nerve cell has one long branch, the axon, which is the branch that carries signals away from the nerve cell, and it turns out it's really hard to maintain the integrity of that very long branch. Remember, we need to keep the nerve cells of our brain for our lifetime, so they not only need to maintain that long branch, but do it forever. So we need these cytoskeletal things to make the axon work well. And in Alzheimer's disease, that becomes destabilized. And so we get these gnarled up remnants of nerve cells that no longer work correctly anymore. And that's where the symptoms come from. If you look in the brain where the neurofibrillary tangles are, that's also where the symptoms come from. So you need those three things to decide someone has Alzheimer's disease, that disease specifically. And we know, this is good news, we know how to detect such things. We have biomarkers, I would argue the person's clinical behavior is a kind of biomarker too, but we have biomarkers to tell us whether these different pathologic processes are occurring. Those biomarkers actually convert well before we have symptoms. Patients have atrophy before they have memory loss. Whether through spinal fluid or now we're evolving blood tests, there's special other types of PET scans to look at the brain. We can know people have amyloid plaque well before they have memory loss. So the biomarkers precede the symptoms. So when a patient comes to us, what we're going to be able to do with people who are evaluating for dementia is looking to see which biomarkers are positive to know which diseases we have to choose from. It's still the clinician that has to do the work of deciding if that disease is also etiologic. That's a judgment call. So what can we do from a treatment point of view? We're still talking about the good stuff. We're still talking about what we can do for patients in terms of diagnosis and treatment. Well, if the timeline of a disease, a neurodegenerative disease, is like this, and you can use this model for a lot of problems that patients come to the medical system for. We'd, life, we'd love to be able to prevent it. We'd love to be able to do something so they never get whatever the problem might be. We can't do that yet for dementia-causing diseases. Well, maybe as the person has worsened to the point where they're now crossing this line of asymptomatic and symptomatic, maybe we can cure the disease. We're nowhere close to being able to do that with the diseases that cause dementia for the vast majority of different dementia-causing diseases. 
Maybe we could arrest the disease so it gets no worse. We're really not able to do that. And I would argue for most of the things that the medical system sees patients for, we don't get to do a lot of these things, prevention, cure, or arrest. For most of the things that we see patients for, we're managing a problem. We're trying to keep ahead of the game by modifying the disease. In neurology, things like multiple sclerosis, for example, we can modify the disease. So if you have to have multiple sclerosis, this is a better time to have it than years ago when we couldn't even do that. And if you can't modify it, then at least provide some sort of symptomatic relief, even though the disease is going to continue to worsen and worsen at the same slope as before. So up until recently, we only had the options to do symptomatic management with drugs that for the most part have been unchanged for over 20 years. But in the last few years, we have now some disease-modifying therapies that actually do change the slope of decline, the most important of which is lecanemab, which was given permanent approval last summer. This is a medicine that affects that amyloid cascade pathway. It's an IV infusion given every two weeks. You only give it to people who have very minimal symptoms because it doesn't make any sense to slow down or stop a disease that's already caused so much brain damage that there's no longer any, anything to prevent anymore, right? So we give it to people with minimal symptoms only if they actually have Alzheimer's disease with biomarkers to show that they have the amyloid plaque the medicine works on. So it's increasingly both possible and necessary to do the work of evaluating patients and knowing what disease may actually be going on so we can treat it. There are possible side effects, including something called ARIA, amyloid-related imaging abnormalities, but for most patients, that's not going to be a symptomatic matter. And as I say, it has had permanent approval by the FDA, and it's expensive, but Medicare says we'll cover it. So these are data from lecanemab showing that, in fact, the medicine does reduce amyloid plaque. People on the medicine had the amyloid plaque reduced, in fact, reduced so much that purely based on biomarkers alone, you wouldn't even diagnose them with Alzheimer's disease by the time these 18 months are over. And their clinical worsening over time is also reduced. People on placebo worked like this. People with lecanemab worsened not so much. So it slowed the slope of decline by not quite a third. And there are more drugs to come with respect to Alzheimer's disease, at least. This is a publication a year ago that reviewing all the drug trials that are in progress as of that date. There were 187 trials evaluating 141 medicines, 36 of which were in phase three, meaning the last level of experiments before you go to the FDA for approval, the vast majority of which are all other disease-modifying drugs. So that's where we're at. We're at a point where we can diagnose dementia-causing diseases, we have good, reliable clinical markers. We have biomarkers to confirm for us what the underlying pathology is in a person's brain. And we have treatments that are disease-specific, at least with Alzheimer's disease, that make a difference. So what's missing? That sounds pretty good, right? Does it sound pretty good? I could just go home. I think, it sound, I think that sounds pretty good. Most of these things I couldn't say 10, 15 years ago. Well, one thing that's missing is not, it's not always Alzheimer's disease. So lots of things can cause dementia. A full evaluation needs to consider a lot of different causes. Most of the time, dementia is caused by Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, frontotemporal degeneration, one of the Parkinsonian syndromes, or some other en entities that you may or may not have heard of, hippocampal sclerosis of aging, a gerophilic grain disease, primary age-related tauopathy, and limbic age-related TDP43 encephalopathy. So 95, 99% are a relatively short list of diseases. Here's an old study, but the data I think are still instructive, of patients with dementia who went to autopsy throughout the state of Florida in various dementia specialty clinics. And what these data showed was that at autopsy, not quite half had Alzheimer's disease and nothing else. Another 35% had 
had Alzheimer's disease and something else, so dual pathologies. But it still leaves not quite a quarter with no Alzheimer's disease at all and another disease entirely. The most common non-Alzheimer's disease was all kinds of Lewy body disease, the two most common examples of which are Parkinson disease dementia and dementia with Lewy bodies. Here's a picture of some uh, uh, old folks from the early 20th century. This guy in blue here is, is a guy named Alzheimer. And his buddy, two to the left of him, is this guy named Louis, who, when he worked in that lab, was Friedrich Heinrich Louis. And when he came over to Ellis Island uh, to immigrate to America, he changed his name to Fred Henry. A good American-sounding name. But he still had published about Louis bodies. He had seen microscopically that in people with Parkinson disease, there were these intracytoplasmic inclusions, these things accu accumulating inside brain cells. And we now know that some people get Parkinson disease dementia. They have Parkinson disease. They have Parkinsonism, the motor problems, and then years later have dementia. But also there are some people who have dementia. They may have little or no Parkinsonism at all. They may develop later, and we call that dementia with Lewy bodies. If you see those people as a slice in time here on the right of these timelines, they look the same. So this is the graph I just showed you of different possible ways we can respond to dementia-causing diseases. We have, no such, we have no place on this timeline for any of these things for Lewy body disease. We only have symptomatic management right now. But even when we get disease-modifying capacities, we are likely to stay in this blue oval. I don't think it's likely that we're going to see a day where we're going to do much of this with the diseases that cause dementia. So although there's a lot to be feeling good about and hopeful about in identifying, diagnosing, and managing neurodegenerative diseases, including those that cause dementia, most of it's going to be in this blue bar. We're probably going to get to go a little bit higher where we can arrest diseases so they don't get much worse. But I don't think that's going to happen very soon. So what do we do with all the people who have problems, and even people with disease-modifying therapies continue to have the same problems when we met them? They continue to have those same problems, and it worsens. This is from the Alzheimer's Association talking about how people with dementia and their care caregivers have a lot of needs that are unmet. Activities of daily living, no longer being able to work in the workforce, supportive and therapeutic environment. Um, how do you do with care planning? Yes, there's stuff we can help with as clinicians. We can help with diagnosis. We can help with medical treatments. But at some level, we're just doctors and nurses and other clinicians. I can't go to the house. I can't do the driving. And as much as I might counsel my patients and their families about what they could do, once they leave my office, they have to go and do it. And I can't do the doing. And I'm sorry, but neither can any of you, as caring and as uh, supportive as you may be. 59% of caregivers identify emotional stress. 38% physical stress. You've got to move them around and move the patient from here to there. So there is a huge need, a largely unmet need, for having not just discussions with patients and families, but recurrently. Here are some of my aphorisms, phrases I found myself saying. The residents are already smirking. Um, phrases I, I have different aphorisms for the residents. <laughs> That's what you're smiling about. Uh, phrases I found myself using all the time in meeting with patients who have dementia. Because the medical part of what I've done with patients really has started to feel fairly straightforward to me. I've been doing it long enough. I can evaluate a patient and I can come to a reasonably good sense of what disease is the cause of the problem. And that's a couple of visits sometimes. After that, Almost all of what I'm doing on subsequent encounters is talking to families, 
the patient, remember, who is demented, is less and less able to participate in the discussion. So what things come up? This is a phrase I got from uh, Arizona Senator Barry Goldwater. Some, of you, some old, old people remember. <laughs> the, the younger people who don't remember Barry Goldwater. He was a senator from Arizona, and he had sort of homespun humor and would use phrases that uh, sounded like, you know, a real one of, one of the folk, one of the people. And he was talking about how a politician was in trouble and was acting cool and collected as if nothing was going on. And Goldwater would said something like, uh, he, he was acting very cool. He, you would never think that he had his tail caught in a crack, which I thought was a wonderful phrase. So the thing that families have to understand is there are not enough resources. There aren't enough, there are not enough nursing homes. There's not enough social workers. There's not enough physicians and clinicians. Our society only has so much to offer so that the families have their burden relieved. The families are the ones who have to be upfront and centered to help that person who has the dementia. It's the families whose tail is caught in a crack. And sometimes I found I had to try and motivate the families to step up to the plate. Say, look, you, I, I can't do the driving. I can't take the car away. I can't make things happen. I can tell you what I think should be done, but you all the ones have to do the heavy lifting. The patient, it's important to understand things from the patient's point of view. And the mismatch between what families are saying or others who are well-intended are saying or doing with the patient is often born from a misunderstanding of what the patient's own perspective may be. So it's important to think about, well, what's going on in that person's mind? And what's going on in their mind is they are in the present moment, but it is a broken present moment, and they're stuck in it. There's philosophies and religions, even, that focus us on being in the present moment. Stop and smell the coffee. Stop and smell the roses. Uh, be fully present with people. Those are good things, we think. And we have a hard time doing it because we're thinking about someone we're upset with or happy with or what am I going to do tomorrow and I regret what I said yesterday and blah, 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 blah. And so you're not really in the conversation. We shouldn't do that. You want to be in the conversation. They are in the present moment, but they don't quite know how they got there. And they don't carry into the present moment much of what everyone else around the person may. And whatever insights they may have at that present moment they're unlikely to take with them to the next moment. So what the families have to understand is you, that's the person you have to interact with. That takes time and practice and skill to get good at. And ultimately, the problem is not that they're forgetful. The problem is not that they have memory loss. The problem is, what is the memory loss allowed to do? If you've got a little old lady living alone who has diabetes and has to remember to give herself insulin every night, the problem isn't that she's forgetful. The problem is that she's forgetful and she's the one that has to give herself insulin. There's just no getting around that. There's no pill for that. There's no medical intervention for that. The only intervention is whoever can influence the living situation. I love this phrase. Most drunk drivers make it home. Now, I'm not adv advocating that you do such things. But we have not only wisdom, but laws that say, if you've been drinking alcohol at some point, you should just not drive. And the pushback from someone might be, listen, I think I'm OK to drive. The issue isn't whether you have the capacity. The issue isn't whether statistically it's predictable that you'll make it home. The issue, the issue is, should you? The mistake that families often make is they say, well, you know, if, if, if dad reaches a point where he can no longer take care of himself, as evidenced by threshold one, threshold two, threshold three, then we'll intervene. You don't wait until after there's been a failure. You don't wait until after the stove is being left on. You don't wait until after a car accident. You don't wait until after the finances have been depleted because they've been scammed. You take steps to intervene, I would say, 
while a person is still not impaired in those ways, before they are. You give your car keys to someone else when you've been drinking, not because you couldn't make it home, but because you shouldn't even try. You have to remember, dear families, that you are the stranger, you are the foreigner in their culture. I remember a husband tearfully saying, I'm just trying to keep her connected to reality. You can't do that. You have to crawl inside their reality. This is not easy to do. And although I can tell you that's the goal, I can't entirely tell you how to do it. It's something you have to figure out because you know that person and you crawl inside by virtue of the many conversations you have, you crawl inside what they're experiencing. So the strategy should be not to use the family interventions that make sense to you, that you predict would work, but to be ruthlessly practical. The stuff you do that works, keep doing that. The stuff you do that doesn't work, don't do it anymore. So you focus on outcomes rather than getting the demented person to agree or understand. Even if you got them to agree and understand that they shouldn't drive, for example. Tomorrow they say, I don't remember saying that. So instead, families should think about, well, what can I do, separate from agreement and insight, what can I do so that driving doesn't occur? Like you take out a spark plug and now the car doesn't work. I couldn't do that. I can't even tell what, which thing is a spark plug. <laughs> I'd have to have you know, someone do that for me. So that's what's missing. That's the big gap. That's what, for the most part, as a physician, I can't do. I mean, I can give those aphorisms, and that's what I do. But at some level, is that even how, how medical is that? And by the way, I've got 30 minutes scheduled for a follow-up, and that's excessive, some might argue. Some clinicians don't have 30 minutes for a follow-up, but my 30 minutes is not enough. And after those 30 minutes, and I have that discussion, the family goes home, and the next day they're calling, leaving a message in the clinic saying, I'm still having this problem and that problem. What are we all going to do about that? Well, I would argue this is much more than we can do as clinicians. So this is Larry Gross, whose daughters are with us today. And I met Larry in 2019. He had dementia with Lewy bodies. I don't remember if I diagnosed him that day or it was, there was a process at least. I put it on my differential <laughs> on that day. And I followed Larry for a couple of years until he passed away. And after he passed away, his family decided to form the Larry Gross Lewy Body Awareness Foundation. Because they recognized, in part because of our discussions, how much of an unmet need there is beyond what we can do, which is good, medically, beyond that, there are a lot of unmet needs. So part of what I wanted to do today is to share with you where we're at, what I think our needs are and what's missing, and introduce this foundation and talk about how this kind of initiative is the kind of initiative I think we need. So I'm going to stop talking and let Amy and Rebecca share a little bit about their journey and uh, address what they think we can do about this. Thanks, Dr. Shanker. Uh, so I am Amy Greenwood, and this is my sister, Rebecca Highland, and we are the Gross Sisters, <laughs> um, as we are commonly called. <laughs> so, um, we wanted to like kind of give you a little bit of our journey of what we experienced, the challenges, and I think going through like just a little bit of a timeline of um, misdiagnoses of our dad in 2013 and 2015. Um, we had noticed some, you know, cognitive changes, and so we, my mom took him to the doctor, took him to their general practitioner in 2013, and said, oh, yeah, he's probably got Alzheimer's. Here's some Aricept. And we left, and then, or they left, and then we're like, okay, the things are not getting better. So 2015, back decides, hey, let's take him to a neurologist and see if there's, you know, see what's really going on here. Not and Dr. Dr. Shanker. And it was not Dr. Shanker that we took him to because he was, again, misdiagnosed. Had we taken him to Dr. Shanker then, probably would not have happened. Um, so fast forward to 2019, things are getting really bad. Um, he's starting to get very unbalanced. Um, he's had several falls. 
we meet them down in Florida in January of 2019 and our dad's face is just, it is just torn up because he had a bad fall in the night. Um, and then after that, um, a few months later, he ended up with a uh, dislocated shoulder. And so then they said, let's go see a neurologist. Fortunately, through really good friends, um, they found Dr. Shanker. <laughs> it was amazing. So um, he gives them the diagnosis of a, a Parkinsonian disorder, a Parkinsonian syndrome called Lewy body dementia for, I guess, the umbrella term. And all her mom heard, which probably most people in her situation, all she heard was Parkinson's because what we know of dementia is Alzheimer's, what we know of, you know, Parkinson's is Parkinson's and tremors and shuffling of the feet. And we're like, well, it baffled us because we couldn't figure out, like, he doesn't have the, like, Parkinson's, like what we would think Parkinson's to be. So we fortunately took him down to, um, we had some connections to the University of Florida Movement Disorder Clinic, who is friends with Dr. Shanker, and which we did not know, because at this point we did, we did not know Dr. Shanker. And after an extensive exam and testing and all of it, he said, well, I've got good news and I've got better news. Good news is you're at one of the best Parkinson's you know, clinics to diagnose. He goes, the better news is you don't have Parkinson's. So we're kind of like, well, this is really weird. Now, obviously, we've never heard of Lewy body dementia. My mom had never heard of Lewy body dementia. And like I said, she just took par Parkinson's from that. So um, we get home, and two weeks later, he suffers a hemorrhagic stroke. And from there, our, our world changed drastically. Um, we had two months there. One month, he was at not the university hospital, he was at the other hospital in town, um, where he was in the ICU for two weeks, and then he was on the neuro floor for two weeks. And then after that, he ended up going to Columbia Post-Acute. If we knew then what we know now, those two months would have looked really, really differently. Um, and that's part of our, our point of our foundation is to get awareness out there so that you can see the signs, especially when, you know, grandma's been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, but she's having REM sleep disorder like our dad did, um, is having a lot of hallucinations and delusions. And we have a, do we just, oh, okay, You're good. sorry. Um, that they are aware of it to say, hey, maybe this is something else. The fluctuating symptoms with Lewy body, which is not typical of Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's, they kind of, Take that steady decline. Louis is a roller coaster. That's why they call it the Louis roller coaster. To where the uh, the fluctuating symptoms, they can walk into the doctor's office, and my dad would seem completely normal, and then three hours later, he's in a full fledged delusion, and you know, trying to you know get the the oh, I can't remember. He called us over one time. Somebody was in the basement, so the delusions were were real. Um, after watching and knowing now what we know about medications, like Haldol, Haldol is never good for uh, a Louis patient, and they gave him a lot of Haldol. Um, and it made him crazy. It made him nuts. Not Our dad also had a paradoxical reaction to medications, meaning he would do the opposite of what they're supposed to do. And after at Columbia Post Acute, when they gave him Seroquel, which, was, which works for some Louis body patients, doesn't work for a lot, but it did not work for our dad. And all it did was amp him up. And he wanted to fight the, the army men in the corner. And he's not completely walking at this point. So we're like, mm, Beck and I talked. And during those two months, we were with him 24 seven. And this is during COVID. And we were fortunate enough that we got to stay with him um, because they realized they did not have the staff over at Columbia Post Acute. So they let us stay with him as long as it was us and we were alternating. Um, but we had decided to stop the Seroquel because nobody was seeing him go from 5.30 when they would give it to him and then the shift change would happen at 7. Then, you know, he would start going, you know, cuckoo at 7 or 7.30. Well, the night shift just thought he was just nuts. So it was we're like, the, we're like, it has to be the Seroquel. Like, it's just, this just isn't making any sense. And we know nothing about medications. Or Louis body. Or Louis body. <laughs> and we don't know at this point that he has Louis body. So we stopped the medications. He kind of, kind of evens out for uh, as much as he could. And we decided to bring him home. So I'll let you take over that part. Um, so April, we brought home my dad 
he was he was in a walker at the time or using a walker at, at the time and um, I can remember one of the very first days we were sitting at the at his kitchen table and he looked at me and he goes why is there a naked guy laying on the counter with a flagpole coming up out of his butt again we don't know anything about Louis body dementia we're thinking this is stroke behavior and that's um, what we were constantly told was yeah. oh delusions hallucinations it's all part of having the stroke and he's recovering so I tried to reason with him which is if you don't know what you're doing you're just he's my dad was a brilliant man so I just said hey dad let's take a walk over to the counter and let's still let's see if it's still there and he said nope it's gone I'm like well that's odd and uh, we went back over kept talking um, we he then another day was out his backyard is a golf course and he said we've got to call up to the pro shop there's all those stick figures out there we got to get them out of the way for all the golfers that are coming through and again you're just, we're just like ah uh. but also when we came home from uh, from Columbia Post Acute her and I and our men back there we're on the same page we we knew how to soothe my dad we knew how to uh, comfort him or redirect him and when we got home, we have a really big family, and nobody's shy on using their words. <laughs> and um, it got to be mayhem. Every, I mean, everybody loved my dad, so they wanted the best for my dad. We were kind of coming on, we weren't unglued, but pe the people that were there that didn't see the 24-7, especially in Columbia Post-Acute, didn't really know how we were operating. So we called Dr. Shanker, which is the missing part and I said to him I said we are in deep dog do our family's crashing and we really need some help and he said I don't have it I don't even have a social worker I living Louis body diagnosing Louis body is two different worlds um, but he was gracious and patient and let us bitch and moan about everything and then he said, yeah, I don't have anything. So little did we know that was actually the beginning, the brainchild of, of what we did for the next year and a half that we didn't know we were doing, but creating these care packets um, that have our book. I mean, we once he told us what Louis Body was, as I should back up to that, when in, during that phone call, he was telling us, well, he was giving Louis Body 101 and a lot of science stuff. And um, for me, for yeah. her, she's like, oh, I love this. Um, and that's when we really dove deep into Google, uh, read probably every book on Louis body dimension, dimension minus the science ones, um, of how people were handling their care person, their person that they were caring for, as well as joining uh, support groups online, trying things, not working, trying other things, working. Um, yeah, so that's when the care packages were being built and then in um, you wanted to talk about the hospital thing oh so the other thing that we learned along the way was and that we encourage others to do through our care package and through talking um, to families of uh, loved ones that have been diagnosed with Louie and is to learn how to advocate for your loved one and it's so important and and I think we put so much pressure on the medical personnel of thinking that you guys have all the answers you should know everything about everything and it's probably not very fair um, so he had fallen in January 2020 he had fallen he was in a state of agitation that he should not have been in but he was and he fell in the garage my mom calls me she's like I called the ambulance you need to come over your dad fell he's going to the hospital so we all go over there they're getting him in he ended up he broke his we took him here to the university Fortunately, we had some friends in the ER that advocated for me to stay with them because it was still COVID. So we went in and they said, okay, yeah, you can stay with them. That's fine, um, just to keep him calm. And, um, and there was a couple of people that kind of knew of my dad's situation and also knew my dad personally, so they knew the ups and downs that we had dealt with. And so as I'm asking, and I'm on the phone with Dr. Shanker at nine o'clock at night, because he is that amazing. <laughs> going, I, what are we going to do, you know? And he's like, well, just make sure that they know that he has Lewy body dementia and, you know, you know the whole rigmarole. I'm like, okay. 
So I asked every doctor and nurse that came in and out, is there, I mean, he dislocated his shoulder, so they're trying to get that in. His shoulder does not want to go in. He's got a clavicle and scapula fracture. He's got a couple fractures in his hip. And my dad, who sold orthopedic supplies, and this is the thing about Showtime, this is the other thing that they do, they show time. And so he's schmoozing with the doctors, like he's going to sell them total hips and total knees, you know? And I'm like looking at him like, okay, I'm like, this is, this is the good part of Louie. You know, he's like, he just jumped right back into that element. But I would ask each doctor or nurse, hey, he's got Louie body dementia. Do you know what that is? Because I mean, we're still, I mean, pretty new because it was less than a year that we learned that he had Louie. And they're like, oh yeah, we know what that is. And I'm like, okay, crazy. But then they would start saying and doing things that were kind of indicating, yeah, they knew what it was, but they didn't really know to the extent of, of what they were going to get. And when they brought out, and they sh when the nurse says the doctor, and she says, well, should I, because he's trying to, he was starting to get a little bit agitated. She's like, well, should I have the Haldol ready to go? And I'm like, no. <laughs> like, and so it was like, that's, then I changed my rhetoric to, have you ever spent any time with a Lewy body patient? And the answer was re resoundingly no. Like, okay, you gotta take, I mean, you gotta take hours because one moment they're fine, the next moment that they're not. Um, so anyways, they did let me stay. He's fine, he get his shoulder back in. Doctors and nurses are getting ready to leave and I know, I know exactly what's gonna happen and I'm just, I'm just trying to keep him calm and we're talking. They all leave except for one nurse. One nurse is standing there, she's charting. And so it's 20 minutes, he goes down the Louie rabbit hole. So after the year of what we know what to do with him, um, I'm like, okay, it's gonna, it's gonna end. We do, I do what I do with him. So about 20 minutes later, and I said, excuse me, he's finally calmed down. I said, excuse me. She goes, oh no, 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 no. She's like, I've already called the house manager. You can't, you can't leave. Like, you're gonna have to stay with him because they wanted to keep him overnight. Um, and the house manager I'd asked for earlier, she came down and she's like, he's fine. <laughs> why, why? You don't need to stay with him. Like that's a little overkill. I go, he's fine now, but. He's not going to be fine in, in 20 minutes or an hour or two hours, especially if I leave and he doesn't have any of his familiar, oh, we have somebody that can watch him. They watch four patients. And I said, my dad will fall before they would ever be able to get to him. So long story short, the nurse said, she says, I've already called the house manager. You have to stay. I did stay. And then I was a squeaky wheel and they let us out really early. <laughs> So that's so it's just about the advocating and the things that we didn't know that we want families to know hey on the front end don't take the the I don't even know countless hours that we took to research and to find these things and we want those resources to be available to to families before they need them to stay one step ahead of Louie so that's the purpose of our foundation so you're going to educate families but also educate healthcare workers. And I mean, that's it's twofold. That's what it is yes. twofold. Stating. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Twofold. That, um, and that's my point of sharing the story yeah. of the hospital is because you do need to be aware of when somebody comes in and says, "Hey, my loved one has you know has Lewy body dementia and falls off the the you know the rails and is and it's like having schizophrenia, bipolar, paranoid delusional behavior all wrapped into one." Doesn't that sound like fun? <laughs> <laughs> Although it was kind of funny sometimes. He did say some really funny stuff. He did. And um, if you go to our website, it has our full story on there as well as the do's and don'ts of what we did. Um, it has a lot of resources for families, for physicians. Um, when we final after my dad had passed and we got together with Dr. Shanker, um, we put together kind of a, a rough draft of what we were wanting to do, gave it to him. He made some changes to it. It's still pretty rough around the edges, but it's from a family that, that understands what other families went through. And we gave him our first 25 bags. Um, and, uh, and if anybody wants bags for their offices, we can gladly get those to you as well. Um, you can go to our website and, ask and request them there. But um, we have served over 450 families throughout the world. It's been a huge blessing for us to serve who we get to serve. Um, it's he's steering the ship right now so um, he's been the biggest blessing for not only my family but um, friends that are receiving these that don't even know what has happened but um, I think you wanted to do a Q&A didn't you yeah well um, I want you guys to be able to be the main a oh, okay. but uh, are, are there questions uh, maybe for uh, 
Rebecca and Amy about, from a family point of view, what, what do you go through when if someone has a dementia and how they're, what, what is it that you need? We have a lot, mostly health professionals here. What is it that you think families need when patients and families are coming to you? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a mic. So, oh, any, anyone ask any questions? Sure. Perhaps? So as a case manager, social worker, um, how can we, because that, that's our role sometimes is to advocate for families. What is, what are the th tips and tricks that we can do to help families that are coming in with this to help be more? So that was really interesting and we would love to talk with you more. Um, we talked about with this with Dr. Shanker the other day. Uh, he said, he goes, well, we, I don't have a social worker. I think we have a social worker in the hospitals, and that's to help trans, trans, transition people to, you know, another facility or home or whatever. And, I mean, ideally, I think it would be great if there was a social worker in neurologist's office, and not just for Louie body, but, um, and we would love to get you some of our packets if you have families um, that are dealing with Louie body for you to pass that along to them. Um, and we're also, we're really open on, we've talked with several families over like specific things that are going on with their loved one that they're dealing with the, the Louie body. So I think, yeah, if you wanted to put them into contact with us, whoever you're working with, if they're open to it, we could, we would gladly get them a care package, talk to them. We talked to a ton of people. Are you located in the Columbia area? We are. Is there a way to keep a few of the packets, uh, sure. bags in the neurology clinic? I mean, that's where they would probably be handed out most. You could say psychiatry and ER too, but they may get lost in the shuffle down there because it's so infrequent. Um, but definitely have some already made in the neurology clinic. That we can do. Yeah. I just, I think this is great. My dad passed away of Louie body in 2019. I didn't have any. I did a lot of digging. I researched. My mom didn't want to know anything about Louie body whatsoever, so I was the one, I'm the oldest of three girls, and so I was the one that did all the research and say, okay, this is the stage now, and my mom would say, he's doing this, and I'm like, well, this is the stage, this is the stage, and like, you guys, the case manager, they didn't know anything about Louie body or the workers, you know, I was the one that was advocating for my dad and then I would talk my sister was here earlier she had to leave but we just did a lot of researching so I think this is this is awesome that you so basically all we did was all the research that you did yeah. we <laughs> just compiled it that's awesome and said hey here because you go I've had friends now that has their, their one of their family members or friend has been diagnosed with Louie body and they, they've been coming to me saying what did you do what and I'm like this is just the steps of every stage, you know, and we went through the whole uh, craziness. They, you know, they'll find one minute, the crazy next minute, and then, you know, it's just, but you, you embrace it, you love them. Right. And you just, you just do, you know. And well, you we have to have that support system. Yes. You know, we had the support system, like, within our men as well, so, yeah. It's huge. Oh. Yeah, we didn't. We wanted to make sure that nobody got stuck with. I don't have anything for you. No, that's awesome. So that's great. the the yeah. last letter that we got, which was a couple of days ago, it said, "Thank you so much. You're keeping me one step in front of Louie, Which she used that phrase earlier, but it's like that's the that's the mission. If you can get it in their hands, and they're like, "Oh, that's coming next," yeah. or or that's how I can jump into that. Yeah. And then, like Dr. Barron said, on the medical side of it, is is to help spread awareness to medical staff because you probably medical staffs probably do know a whole lot about it um right but how you handle them is in dr shanker kind of you know it's that's where we went on the you know the the big blue circle of it's about dealing with the behavior jumping into the delusion that she did first you tell it so i'll leave this one with you so He's having a delusion. I'm over at Beck's house, and we get called over because he's like, Beck, he goes, there's naked ladies in the hot tub in the TV room. Your mom's going to be home any time now. <laughs> and this is, like, they've got to get out. I just don't want them here. And so we go over. And but they can come back later when she's not it, here. Right. <laughs> and so our mom is on the screened in porch yeah. because... Kind of like you said, she wasn't really interested in learning about like what to do. Exactly. It was just, but she was also grieving her husband, exactly. which is a very common thing for a spouse yeah, um, yeah. 
when they're going through Louie body. So she's grieving. So I mean, it's yeah. So we gave her the you know the pass. You can go out to the porch, but um, so we go in there, and we're like, you know, what's going? He's like, I just want all the naked ladies in the hot tubs to go home. Mm-hmm. So we're like, okay. Um, so Beck jumps up. She's the smart one. Jumps up and goes, okay, ladies, let's go. Time to leave. And I'm looking at her like, okay, this is the weirdest. And now we've wa- we've watched these videos, we've read the books, we've read what to do, and she's like, she's doing it. And I'm like, okay, this is interesting. And so then my dad, like you can see, he's getting relieved. And then all of a sudden, he kind of looks at me like I, I can tell the angry look. And he's like, I'm like, what? And he goes, well, aren't you gonna help her? <laughs> sure am. <laughs> hey, you in the corner, let's go, out. <laughs> he's like, oh, okay, great. So she comes back after literally walking them to the door, yeah. shutting the door, and he's, you can tell he's calm. He's, and uh, <laughs> so then the next day. So the next morning, I went to pick him up to take him to Planet Fitness to work on balance and strength stuff, and he gets in the car and he goes, well, what do I have again? And I go, you have this dementia, it's tiny little proteins, and I'm not getting medical because I know y'all are medical people, um, and again, learning about Louie, I go, and you have hallucinations sometimes, and he's like, well, like what? And I go, well, last night we were over here, naked ladies, hot tub, had to get him out. He goes, can I keep that one? And so his his humor was still intact, his personality was still there, just occasionally it would yeah. would plummet. So, any the other COVID, questions? Did you have a... Well, they, they kind of went into what I was gonna ask about like practical samples of- even uh, if you could touch on like redirection, so you kind of touched on kind of going ahead, going along with what mm-hmm. he thinks is happening. Uh, were there ever times where it was more just frank aggression, and what ways did you kind of get around that or redirect? So um, I was going to get one. I I was. You make a first. No, go ahead. So I was um, apparently I was either well we were running either a whorehouse out of his house or I was running a. Uh, a facility, a, a, like an assisted living facility, because we used to have, my grandparents had started Candlelight Lodge, which is an assisted living facility. I worked there, so I think in my dad's brain, he just associated me with that. But I was also driving the business into the ground. So it was, and he was, and he was getting angry about it. And he's like, Amy, he's like, you're just, you're not doing this right, you know? And so the redirecting was absolutely 100% key in, in this situation, because it was, okay, um, you know what, Dad? You're right. I really need your help. Would you be willing to help me out? Like, can I come over? Can we make an appointment? Can I make an appointment with you? Because that was always his thing. Let's make appointments. I said, can I make an appointment with you tomorrow morning? And we'll come in and, you know, we can talk about this. And you can, you know, I'll bring all the paperwork in. He goes, that'll be perfect. Great. I go, okay, what do you want for lunch? And it was just a complete, just, he got what he wanted out of it, which was, you need help. I want to help you. And then, yes, we, you just redirect straight to something else. So I want to highlight a couple of the examples you gave. Notice how non-confrontational these Has were. To be. And what they, what all these examples were, they don't really take on the issue directly. They don't say, no, that's not really happening, or this is not occurring. They just give him something else to handle, something that happens to be incompatible with being upset or otherwise doing whatever wasn't going out going on correctly. This is why I say you focus on outcomes, mm-hmm. right? It's win, stay, lose, shift. These are great examples. And we had to use that because when we're cap grassing, I'm sh- I don't know if you guys all know what that is, but it's the, like the imposter syndrome. So my mom looked like my mom, acted like my mom, had all my mom's memories, and then it was still not my mom. What is that residence? What is that called? Say it. Oh, she said it? Oh. Yeah. (laughs) You weren't listening. Um, So my mom would try to explain to him all of these things, and it it did not matter. So one night I get called over there, it's middle of the night, and one of the care workers that was there called and said, get over here, your dad's going crazy, so get over there. And I'm like, Dad, what's going on? He's sitting on the edge of the bed, and he goes, there's a lady in bed with me. And I go, (laughs) well... I think that's mom, you know, because I don't know where he's at in the thing. And he goes, I don't think so. And I go, well, I think it's okay. I don't think she's going to touch you. You know, like, because I, I knew my mom wasn't going to get out of the bed. But and my she dad. She she wasn't, yeah. Yeah. Well, she was sleeping at this one. But, um, 
he just he just was not gonna let it go that I, I'm gonna be cheating on your mom and I said let's do this let's just let's go out to the, the room let's get something to eat and this again is two o'clock in the morning and then by the time he switches around and goes back to bed it's my mom again so it's like Amy did one where she told my mom to go in and change her shirt and come back out yeah. and that was her again yeah, that's smart. So it's just, you know, little little things. There's one, we, we had a really cute little uh, short CNA girl that um, he fell in love with, literally fell in love with. But one night she had called me over, she goes, something's up, I don't know what's going on. I get over there and I go in to talk to my dad. He's laying in his bed again and Shelly is her name. She comes walking up and he just pops her. and. I go, Dad, and I'm like, because I'm like, whoa, that came out of nowhere. And uh, he goes, she was swinging a big, a, two by four. A, a big two by four at me. And I go, okay, well, let me go talk to her, tell her to put it down. And and then I go back and I usually rubbed his feet or his arms because he liked that. And he settled right back into bed. And so no, that's another, that's a great example. This is why um, an antipsychotic or a benzodiazepine wouldn't have stopped him from from punching because that's a very you could argue an appropriate response to someone swinging a two by four again. right he's making a wrong conclusion so medications are not anti-conclusion pills anti-conclusion right? <laughs> yeah. yeah so there's a out on our table we have a, a little thing of what they see like so if you see a 3d object they look at it it's only 2d um he did have he had uh, double vision which okay. we took him to the eye doctor a gazillion times and to OT, the OT ophthalmologist, I can't remember what exactly what they were called, um, and had horrible double vision. Colors weren't right. And he kept on saying, like, there's just something wrong with my eyes. And had we known then, because we still did not know that the visual stuff was an issue, and again, the OTs that we took him to didn't put it all together either. Of, well, this is just Louis. And it is just Louis. Um, but what you can see on that paper out there, and I urge everybody to take a look at it, it would be super frustrating to see like that, you know? And in shadows, and your kind of tunnel vision, and you can't see peripherally. So when someone's coming at you, we learned quickly, early on, Slow. go slowly. Walk into the room slowly. And actually, we figured the that out before me. it was, yeah, before it was Louie. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, but yeah, that's. Well, that was great. Rebecca and Amy. Well, thank uh, you. Thanks for having us. Dr. Schenker, but and thank you, Dr. Thank Schenker. You. Uh, thank you, Dr. Schenker, Rebecca, Amy. Uh, I got to know the Gross sisters over the last couple years and how this is a real passion of theirs, and I wanted to get their message in front of as many people as possible. So it's a good thing this is recorded. So, you know, I think we can then. Uh, Dr. French, Dr. Young Walker can show this to all their residents and, and staff, uh, their faculty and, and staff in, the, in their respective areas. Uh, and then Dr. Robinson, I want him to be able to show it to all of his ER docs and nurses um, because you just, you just said all the great stuff they need to know. So those who weren't here will get to see it. Yeah. So, all right. Thank you. Well, once again, thanks very much. Thank you all. Yeah, thanks for coming. Thank you. Yeah. Everybody. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Of course.